Hey Tommy, we got to spend a couple days in Detroit this week because there is a brand new car, well not brand new, but a rebirth of an American iconic vehicle. What were we doing in Detroit? Well, we were taking a look at the new Jeep Wagoneer and the Jeep Grand Wagoneer. Yeah, dude, we got to go hands-on and that was really nice because Jeep only invited a handful of journalists to actually go and shoot the vehicle and then kind of crawl through it. Uh, and in this podcast, we're going to be talking about everything we learned by actually sitting in it, crawling around in it, healing the buttons, whatever else you do in a car uh, that's brand new and iconic. Uh, and where were we at, dude? It was pretty cool, too. It was the Connor Assembly Plant, which was this big empty warehouse in, um, oh, where was it? Near Warren, Michigan, I think? or Yeah, it's Sterling outside Heights. Detroit, yeah. Yeah, and this old, um, basically, warehouse was actually an assembly plant, and you could tell that because it had tracks in the floor. And that's where they used to build the Dodge Viper. Yeah, yeah, now it's kind of just sits empty, and it's sad because it's this big building, right, with just a bunch of old signs hanging from the side of it. Uh, must have been really cool when you guys were building the, uh, well, if you guys, I mean, the employees there were building the Viper. I mean, that's a big plant for a very small and slow production car. You think so? I thought it was a tiny plant. Really? Compared to like your typical car plant, yeah. I mean, you could walk from one end of this thing to the other in a matter of 35 seconds. Your typical car plant, you'd be, you know, walking miles to get from one end to the other. And it was neat because uh, on, they had murals of Vipers on the, on the walls and, and you could see where the, uh, the assembly line would have gone down through. And it was very like, you know, uncommercialized. It almost felt like a little homegrown thing in that there were no big robots or if there were, they'd been removed. I think the Viper was pretty handmade. So anyway, it was a cool, cool place to have a new reveal. Yeah, and before we get to, uh, you know, the Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer, uh, I have to give a big thank you to Jeep for inviting us. Like I said, we were one of a handful of automotive journalists that got to actually go and uh, see the vehicle. And, you know, because of COVID, obviously, they can't do the typical kind of thing they would do where they invite everybody in. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we got uh, we got exclusive and early access. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you, Jeep. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you, Tommy, you think that they'll ever build another Viper before we get to all the uh, Grand Wagoneer stuff? Uh, I mean... <laughs> I think they, they, there may have been a chance under the Fiat Chrysler automobile umbrella. But now that Jeep has, um, or sorry, now the Jeep, now that Dodge has become one with Peugeot. Stellantis. Yes, Stellantis. I am not sure that the French are going to be willing to uh, build a bespoke 10 cylinder. I just don't think that's up their, uh, up their wheelhouse. I think, I think they should build an electric Viper. Wouldn't that be cool? That would be really, I mean, maybe they will. That would be a really, I didn't even think about that as a possibility. It's a great idea. The E Viper, the E Viper, the Viper um, EV, the uh, the Viper ass, and <laughs> call it really fast. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up now. But let's talk about the Grand Wagoneer and the Wagoneer. So we get there, um, and uh, like I said, there's nobody, nobody in this plant. It's basically an empty uh, car factory. Uh, but they had three vehicles. Well, two and a half vehicles, right? Yeah, they had the. Um uh, the chassis, so they had a rolling chassis. That's a half. Yep, that was pretty cool, where they have the wheels and the tires and the engine and the transmission and the suspension. And then they had the Wagoneer, which, and we'll talk about this, but that was the more affordable of the two. And then the Grand Wagoneer was on the other side of the building, so they were on two different ends of the, uh, of, of the basically the warehouse. Yeah, now what's crazy to me, a little bit crazy at least, is that the Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer are built on the same chassis. Now, keep in mind, uh, one of the things uh, that uh, uh, Jeep did for us, or still Antis, I'm never going to get used to that, did for us when we got there was they, lo they loaned us uh, a Dodge Durango SRT. And that's important because that's also a three-row family hauler, uh, and yet... A lot of people are thinking to themselves that either the Grand Wagoneer or the Wagoneer, which I, like I say, built on the same chassis, are uh, basically a Ram 1500 or a Durango, and they're not. So it's interesting because it's very, it's a very big SUV. I mean, proper full size, yeah. right? Um, I think body we, on frame. Yeah, we looked it up. It was like so the the, the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer same size. Um, and they are about four inches longer in total length than a Tahoe, but something like 11 or 14 inches shorter than a Suburban. A suburban. Yeah. yeah, so that's an interesting thing, but it is a body on frame. Yeah, and, it's, and the reason they had the chassis there was to show that this is not uh, basically a Ram 1500, you know, like, I mean, everybody knows, by, well, not everybody, but it's 
Pretty obvious that like a Tahoe and a Yukon and a Suburban are the Silverado, right, with a different top for the most part. So what I'm curious about, unfortunately, I would have loved to talk to an engineer, but there was nobody around the vehicles. I mean, it was like the, the PR folks and that was it. I am, PR folk. Folk, one yeah. folk. Um, I am not convinced that it isn't a Ram 1500. But they had the chassis there and they said it was completely new. So let's talk about, let, before we get to that, let's talk yeah. about the fact that it's not a Durango. So a Durango is a unibody vehicle, right? which means it's built uh, by basically putting the vehicle together as opposed to having like a ladder frame with an engine, a transmission and suspension hung and then the body stuck on top of it. So that is obviously different. And you know, we did get to drive that Durango SRT around, which by the way does share an engine with uh, the uh, Grand Wagon here, that uh, big Hemi, but uh, we did get to drive around and it, it feels and is very different from the wag Grand Wagon here. I mean, they're like separately, officially and very distinctly different cars. Well, basically with a unibody, I mean, the, the shell, the components are the structure. Whereas a body and frame is like an old school American car where you can separate the two and still have the, the backbone with the, all the stuff bolted on top of it. Yeah, so you can't, you can't share the same platform if one's body and frame, one's unibody. And the Durango is, uh, it, it's pretty, pretty small compared to the new Jeep. Yeah, the Jeep is really big. Uh, it's almost like, you know, uh, navigator size big, right? And it's that kind of boxy, squarey. And the reason we're comparing it to Durango is obviously, uh, you know, Durango. both, yeah, Durango is that yeah. Dodge and Jeep are owned by Stellantis. So, you know, different brands, but same company. Yes, that's right. And it's an interesting thing because, um, first of all, the Wagoneer name, um, is, Sounds weird if you have never heard it. Yeah, but it dates back to like the early 1960s. So there, there was a full-size Jeep SUV model, and the internal designation was the SJ. And they built it from 62 all the way up through 1991. Um, and they had multiple forms throughout the uh, that time period. But the basic, the basic construction was identical. Uh, and it's crazy to think. So this was a vehicle built for 30 years, and it survived through Kaiser's ownership of Jeep. It survived through AMC's ownership of Jeep, and it survived through Chrysler's ownership of Jeep. Um, it was one of the longest running American nameplates, yeah, and that's where the name comes from. It's iconic, and uh, classic Wagoneers are really sought after now. It's really, you could argue that it's the first um, big, because maybe the Range Rover was the first luxurious uh, SUV. Uh, it's hard to say. It's certainly the first American luxury SUV. It's, it's the vehicle that created that segment. And so people want those first uh, Wagoneers and Grand Wagoneers because they were the original. And the idea was, and it, it once again- A it luxurious off-roader. It depended hugely on the year, but like the Wagoneer for the most part was more of the attainable one. And then the Grand Wagoneer had the, the wood paneling on the side. And that was the one that had the full pleated leather. Wait, wait, did it have real pa wood paneling or by then did it have well, stickers? It was, yeah, I mean, it, it, was stickers. A, it was a veneer. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so that was the one that, and, and a lot of people think, like you said, that was the, the vehicle that introduced the luxury SUV segment. I mean, it was either the Range Rover, which was sort of luxurious at the time, or the Grand Wagoneer, which was just off the charts and comfortab comfortable. Yeah, because the, the Suburban's been around longest. So the Suburban is the oldest nameplate in America, for those of you keeping track. But it's always been the every person kind of vehicle, right? The Grand Wagoneer, when it first came out, was luxurious, right? It had a lot of style. It had a lot of uh, kind of like, you know, it was a vehicle you could take to the opera. And then if you wanted to drive it across America, you could do it as well with your family. Now, the Escalade, which is also in that, that segment, uh, that was, I think that came out 25 years ago or something. But it wasn't around. Uh, it wasn't around long. in like the 70s or 80s. Right. No. So uh, let's get back to the, the wagon and the Grand Wagon here. Well, hold on, before we do that, the other thing we skipped was you said you, don't, you, you think it's a Ram, basically. And I, I have to disagree. So first of all, they did have the chassis there. And now, of course, they didn't have a Ram chassis next to it. I'm sure it probably shares a lot of components with the Ram. But... Uh, well, let's start with the components of chair. It, you know, if you get the Wagoneer, uh, you get the 5.7 liter Hemi V8 with um, basically a mild hybrid system. They call it E-Torque. And if you get the Grand Wagoneer, then you get the big Hemi, right? The 6.4 liter. Yeah. Uh, and they, the difference between them is I think the 6.4 puts out 470-ish horsepower. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to that. I've got all the stats here. Okay, all right. Uh, anyway, so, so yes, uh, the 5.7 is available in the Wagoneer, but uh, 
there are significant differences. First and foremost, it's independent suspension all around. Yes. Which the truck isn't. Right. Also, you have air suspension all around. Optional. Uh, but the truck doesn't. The truck has airbags. This has real air suspension, right? This has air suspension on the front and on the back. The truck has basically helper. Um, no, the, the new Ram has. You can you can lower a Ram too. Yeah. I think it even has front air suspension. Does I, it? I think that's actually a similarity. So I understand your argument, and I don't know what the official word is from Jeep if it's if it's its own chassis, but I'm looking at the press release. And where do you think it's built? It's in the, built in the same factory as the Ram 1500. It's built at the Warren, um, Michigan yeah. truck assembly plant. And but it's not just built at the same factory. It's built on the same okay. assembly line as the Ram 1500 Classic. Fair, fair enough, but I, I've been to that plant recently and we drove kind of by it this time. I went there to pick up the TRX and dude, that plant is literally like 1500 blocks long. But if it's on the same line itself, it's, not it's, just in the same building, it's on the same track as they get put together. I mean, you, can, you couldn't build a Fiat 500 and a Ram 1500 on the same no, track. No, you couldn't, of course. Uh, so I think, yes, they're gonna tell you that it's probably very different. I would be surprised if it does really it, is all it, that different. Does it matter? I don't know. Uh, you no, know, I don't it, think it matters. I mean, yeah. it does. So, like, if you look at uh, when the Escalade first debuted, yeah. right, Under it was just a rebadged, like, Tahoe or Suburban, which was underneath very similar to the, like, the GMT 400 platform, whatever it was at the time. Uh, nowadays, there's still similarities between the Escalade and, like, the Tahoe Suburban um, and, and the full-size truck. But of course, like the Escalade and those guys, they have the independent rear suspension, even though there are similarities between like a Silverado. Anyway, we're deep into the uh, <laughs> Wagoneer uh, um, uh, swamp right now. Maybe not, I shouldn't call it swamp. Uh, maybe the lake, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so let's, let's, let's swim back to the shore and let's talk about the things that people who aren't so deep into this kind of, you know, where the thing's made, how it's made, and, you know, what's under the skin. So let's go, uh, like, very basic. Let's, yeah, let's talk about the basic stuff, and then let's talk about our impressions. And let's start with the Wagoneer, because that was the one we filmed first. Right. And then we'll do the Grand Wagoneer. So start with the Wagoneer. From, like, the very basic concept of the thing. It has four wheels. The, well, less basic than that. <laughs> the the t two models... The Wagoneer is the cheap one, the Grand Wagoneer is the expensive one. Right. That, that's a good way of looking at yeah, it. Yeah, which is, once again, I'm, at the end of this, we can talk about this. I'm not sure because they're built on the same chassis, so like one isn't any bigger than the other. Really, the difference is the power plant and the accoutrement, you know, all the interior bits, the quality of workmanship, I suppose, to some extent, the leather, uh, uh, and, you know, basically how fancy it is. But really, in, in, in a lot of ways, they're the same vehicle. But let's start with the Wagoneer. So let's start with the basic facts. 5.7 liter V8, right? Yeah, how much only, horsepower? only engine choice. So it starts at $57,995. Yep. Um, so the Wagoneer, you can get in both two-wheel drive yep. and four-wheel drive. And there are a bunch of different four-wheel drive systems available as well. Um, it's like the Jeep systems, right? Quadra Tech 15 and 16. Yeah, it's not that 18. confusing. It's, it's easier than that. Um, so that starts at $57,000, $58,000. But that's, of course, late availability for the cheap one. Uh, there are three different series of Wagoneer. So Series 1, Series 2, and Series 3. And then there's two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive versions. Um, but and basically... The, and the higher the series, the more fancy and expensive. Yeah, starting MSRP ranges from 58000 uh, all the way up to about 76000 So those are your two different starting MSRPs uh, from the cheapest to the most expensive one. Now, if you're listening to this on YouTube, you may be wondering, what does it look like? Uh, if you're watching it, you can see it over my shoulder. Uh, and I guess the best way to describe it is... Uh, if you've ever seen the Chinese Commander, which is a Jeep vehicle that's sold in China, it's very similar. If you haven't seen that, think about a very boxy, very straight, very edgy uh, uh, vehicle with, you know, a seven-slotted seven, seven -slotted grille, kind of squinty headlights. Um, it's, uh, it's a big box, basically, right? Yeah, well, the Jeep is called the Grand Commander in China. Grand Commander, yeah. And there's no mention of it in the press release, but it does look remarkably similar it to the Chinese. Uh, yeah, so do you remember, like, the old-school Jeep Commander? Yep. For, that they sold here in the yeah, U.S.? Yeah, it's like that, but a little bit more rounded off. That was even more boxy. That was even more boxy, yeah. Uh, the rear end's kind of got these um, uh, very, very narrow taillights, LED taillights. Uh, very slab sided on the on the sides, very vertical in the rear. One thing that I really just can't get over with the design, I think it's a good design, but they did something that's very different compared to most modern SUVs. So they actually body colored 
the B and the C pillar. And what I mean by that is if you look at most modern cars, the B and the C pillar and the D pillar. So, are, so let me define what B and C pillars are. They're basically are. the posts. So yeah, the, like, the, like the first post where if you're sitting in the vehicle and driving it, the, the, the column in front of the window there, that's the A pillar. Then the one you know where your window is at and ends is a B pillar. And then the next one's a C and D and so forth. Yeah, so uh, they painted the the B, C, and the D pillar body color. Yeah, most, most every car, it's black. Yeah, so they black it out because they want to have a continuous flow line between the uh, the windows. So they, they kind of want it to look like a pillarless coupe. Or it gives you a floating roof, too. That, yeah. That's the other thing you can accomplish with that. Jeep went the other way and said, we're going to have very individual subdivided sections, um, which is a much more old school way of doing it. So old cars typically painted the B, C, and D pillars. My issue with it is, is it's a very, very long vehicle. And if you get it in a bright color like white, it almost looks too long, almost like a school bus. I mean, it just, it's, it's a there's lot a, of sheet metal. There's a little bit of like um, oh, airport uh, bus, you know, the, the one, the rent-a-car, a little bit of that feeling to it with the way that that's done. But that's only if you're being cruel. I don't want to be cruel because I think, once again, they went for an old school look and they achieved it. Whether you like it or not, that's something up to you. Um, it's not that old school. There's no wood on the side of it. Well, yeah. How could it be, old, be that old school? old school? The other weird thing is uh, it says Wagoneer on the front or Grand Wagoneer uh, and on the side, and there's a little American flag, but I could not find a single Jeep logo. Oh, found, there's a, there, you found one. There's a little, like, stamped into the side mirror. Yeah, I found a little tiny one kind of by the, uh, the, the side mirrors. It doesn't say Jeep on the front. It still has the seven-slotted grille, which yeah. is kind of the iconic Jeep design now. But it says Jeep nowhere. Mostly nowhere. Even on the steering wheel, it says Wagoneer, which is just crazy. And I, and I think I know the reason for that, and that is once you get to the Grand Wagoneer, you can go over $100,000. So I think they're trying to kind of separate this from the everyday Grand Cherokee or, I don't know, Renegade, right? And they're trying to create a much more luxurious, much more upscale vehicle without creating a new brand. And so the way they do it is they kind of... Um, detune the Jeep and uptune the Wagoneer. Um, names. I, oh, but the names. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah, get it? The names, not the engine. What's kind of... I was trying to be clever there, Tommy, but apparently I wasn't clever Yeah, enough. I'm not sure it came through. <laughs> so what, uh, what is a little bit confusing is basically you have, in, the, in this new lineup, you have the Expedition competitor and you have the Navigator competitor. Right? The Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer. Yeah. But what's unusual is that if you go to buy an Expedition, you're going to a Ford dealer, which is a very different experience than if you're going to buy a Navigator, which is a Lincoln dealer. Um, and they're two different brands. Ford. Or, G or GMC and Cadillac, right? Same. Yeah, or Chevy. Yeah. Uh, they're, trying to, they're trying to represent two different thought processes. But both of them are Jeeps. I don't so, think a thought process is as much as they are just brands. Well, yeah, but they're trying to go for different images. Right, they're creating two brands. They're creating, or better yet, a sub-brand within the Jeep brand. So you've got the Jeep brand, right, which represents Wranglers and Gladiators and Renegades and Grand you're, Cherokees. You're not going to see that, though. And then you've got the Wagoneer brand, which is it's, no, two vehicles. No, it's, it's not its own brand, though. It's it's still a model. They're, they're just two models within the well, Jeep line. Well, well, if I go by, we're going to be arguing here, but if I go by the fact that there is no Jeep nameplate on the vehicle, right, it doesn't say, you know, every vehicle has the brand and then the vehicle. So do you buy it at a Wagoneer dealership? No, but I'm saying that's what they're kind of doing. Because no, they're, they're going kind of, I understand what you're saying, but I disagree because you still have to buy it at the same place you buy a two-door Wrangler. Yeah, but you, so it's a baby step. It's like, you know, Toyota and Prius. Prius has become its own internal brand. Sort of. Nobody knows Prius as its own internal but brand. But that's, the, thing, that's Prius, the thinking that Toyota does, right? Prius the, is dead. They killed the Prius brand too, by the but way. But you see what I'm saying? That's the same thing they're kind of going after. Yes, but I there was Because originally there was just a Prius, right? Which was a Toyota, but it was a Prius. And then the Prius came in like four different flavors. No one's going to fall for that. No one fell for the Prius. It's still at the end of the day. It's All right, a, well, it's let's, let's get the stuff people want to know about. Silly argument about it. Anyway, uh, let's go back to the Wagoneer, Tommy, and let's talk about you know once we actually got our hands on it what you felt about it and what it was like um, well it's expensive first of all so it's even at the $58,000 starting price I mean it's far more expensive than the other three row in the FCA or Stellantis lineup which is a Durango um, and there's also the new Grand Cherokee L which is coming out as well this is far more expensive than that in flesh it's very very big I mean it's it's just a lot of it's a lot of sheet metal um, and it's very imposing in person too. Uh, the grill is tall, the front end is tall, the sides are pretty unforgiving. Uh, 
but it's very nice on the inside. So um, on the inside, both of them are pretty similar, but the Wagoneer is a little bit less luxurious. So the, the leather is still nice, not quite as nice. It has less screens, way less screens. Uh, it still has got this very big, almost full-size truck-like center console and has a safe. Yeah, it has a safe. Well, the Wagoneer has a safe, like that hotel safe, right, that, with the numbers on it that you get at a hotel to lock up your uh, valuables. And the Grand Wagoneer has a refrigerator, at least the one we saw in that center armrest, which a lot of vehicles have, right? Like right. the Toyota Land Cruiser has that. But yeah, the inside certainly does shine. That's where the, 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 the you know, that's become Stellantis' thing, or it used to be FCA's thing, where they would really up the quality of the interior and here they have done that i mean everything you touch is either leather or metal uh, very uh, limited use of scratchy plastics um, you know it, it all feels very upscale the the, the seats are pleated uh, perforated uh, the uh, controls are either, well, this is actually really nice, like the main controls, the radio controls and the HVAC controls, unlike in our TRX, aren't actually touch screen, they're, they're real, right? So like if you want to move up uh, the um, air suspension, it's a little like toggle switch that goes up and down, which is really cool. Right. Uh, same thing if you want to scroll through the different drive modes on the other side of it. So you've got, I think there's like five drive modes, like off-road, sport, snow, uh, custom or and then comfort, I think, if I remember right. I'm probably guessing at it, but it's pretty close. I have them here. Okay. Yeah, I, we're going too deep into the weeds, but I think people just want to know the differences. So on the outside, the Wagoneer is supposed to be more aggressive and off-roady. I thought we were just talking about the Wagoneer. I didn't, I, we haven't even got to the Grand Wagoneer. Well, you, you, you kind of... No, I said we were talking about the chassis and the blurred, Wagoneer. You blurred, you blurred We're not talking about the Grand, we're just talking about the Wagoneer right now. Well, you kind of have to talk about both of them because they're, they're just... You're the one trying to talk about both of them. I'm trying to keep them separate. Yeah, but you were blurring the line on the interior there. Because... I wasn't. I was talking about the Wagoneer. I, I have saved the uh, Grand Wagoneer for later. Well, it's confusing because a lot of what you talked about on the Wagoneer is the same as the Grand Wagoneer. I mean, it's it's a very confusing thing because on the inside they both have a 12.1 inch touchscreen except, display. Except how much does, okay, all right, if you want to conflate them, we'll conflate them. How much does the Grand Wagoneer start at? Well, it starts at 87,000. And it goes well above 100. Um, but for example, so like the Wagoneer has got leather seats, yeah. they're very nice. The Grand Wagoneer has like quilted leather seats, uh, <laughs> you know, which is even nicer. The, uh, the Wagoneer has, you know, decent trim on the inside, but then the Grand Wagoneer has like this crazy mahogany everywhere. So it's supposed to be much more it has fancy. The, the Grand Wagoneer has like the wood grain with uh, the inset in gold, of course, Grand Wagoneer name right in front of the passenger. It's like stenciled. It's kind of funky. And, and it also has seven screens. Yeah, so the Wagoneer, let's talk about it. So um, Now you're conflating it. Okay. Well, hang on. I'm getting there. The, the Wagoneer has a 12.1 inch screen yep. infotainment. You connect five. The Grand Wagoneer has a 12.1 inch screen, you connect five. That's the same. Right. Although the colors were a little different. Okay. Um, they both have that full digital instrument cluster, at least the ones we saw. In front of the dri driver, yeah. Yeah. Where the difference occurs is underneath the main infotainment, the Wagoneer had like a little cubby. The Grand Wagoneer had a separate screen down there, a 10.1 inch screen, which controlled the rear climate system, it controlled the massaging seats. It was a very, very almost like Range Rover-like, and the standard Wagoneer didn't have that. Yeah, and it also, the Grand Wagoneer also had an additional optional screen in front of the passenger. Right. If you wanted that kind of, I think Ferrari was the first one that did that, where it would display the speed limit to the terrified passenger. <laughs> Apparently, did you know, it's one of those cool screens where you can only see it if you're like head on? Yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah. So, so I, with, the, with this vehicle, it's not to terrify the passenger to show them what triple digit speed you're doing and you're super fast. It's to actually be able to like watch a movie while the driver is still eyes on road because the driver, with the way the glass is done, cannot see what's being displayed on the screen in front of the passenger, which is pretty cool. Right. Now, I do think it's interesting that this, both steering wheels said Wagoneer on it. They didn't say Jeep. Um, same thing in the puddle lights. It didn't say Jeep. It said Wagoneer. So you're right about that. They're trying to differentiate the brands. Um, the, the Grand um, truck had the uh, wood, <laughs> more wood on the steering wheel, where the, the Wagoneer we sat and didn't. Um, should we talk about the four-wheel drive systems? Yeah, I, you know, go for it. I guess my only, I, you know, I, I'm very confused with Jeep's four-wheel drive systems. I find, I, I've said this before in the podcast, I think they need to make it much simpler. I think Audi's in the same position. They have like four different Quattros. 
it used to be simple, you know, like the difference between uh, the, the, the quattros is significant, right? So some of the new quattros are actually front wheel drive and the engineers will tell you that like within that time space, it can go to all wheel drive, but it's not like Subaru's all wheel drive all the time. And, and Jeep does something very similar. You know, they have these different Quadratech, is it Quadratech? Is that what it's called? Quadra, Quadra. <laughs> quadra Tech is the aftermarket. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's the aftermarket. What's, what's Quadra Drive? Well, I'm about to See go what I mean? it. Right. It's very simple. All right, go for it. We'll make it super simple. All right. So the the standard Wagoneer, you yeah. can get in two wheel drive. Okay. So you can get a rear that, wheel drive. That's easy. I get that. Does that make sense? Yeah. The Grand Wagoneer, you can't get in two wheel drive. So it's all Grand Wagoneers are four wheel drive. All wheel drive. Um, four wheel drive. Okay, four wheel drive. See, now we're already splitting hairs. Okay, does it, are you are you caught up? So yes. Wagoneer, you can get don't, both. Don't, yes, I, I get that. Tom. Okay. Now here we go. Very simple. Quadra Track One. Quadra Track. Okay. This is a full-time four-wheel drive system. Yeah. With no low range. Okay. So it's high range only. Okay. It also doesn't have the different drive modes. Okay. So remember how you were excited about like the rock right. modes, and this one doesn't have that one. All right. Up from there is Quadra Track Two. Okay. One more than one. Quadra Track Two gives you a low range. It also gives you some sensors so you can, uh, uh, you know, prevent slippage. And then you can also get the, uh, the, the little buttons right. so you can control the rock mode. And now the top dog. Are you ready? Yeah. Quadra Drive 2. So this is, Jeep has been doing this for a lot of years, but the Quadra Drive system is the best system. It has an ELSD, um, which is supposed to be the most capable version, uh, and it can um, anticipate I, low traction stuff. Tommy, I think you just made my point. I mean, really. Let's see, Quadra Track 1, look, Quadra look, Track 2, Quadra Drive 2. It's, it's pretty I mean, simple. There's only three of them. And Range, Land, Range Rover, Land Rover have been around about the same time, right? Uh, Jeep is older, you know. Land Rover kind of copy Jeep in some ways, but if you get a Range Rover, you get one choice of all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive systems, uh, and then the only option you can get on that is maybe a locking rear diff. That's you, all you need. You, my friend, have not seen every everyone has you know dynamic uh, uh, terrain management control. Oh no no no! You have not been on a Land Rover press set recently. Have you seen what Discovery has done? What Discovery now has like four different four-wheel drive systems. You can get it without a low range. You can get it with the low range. You can get it oh, with the range. That's right. The they got rid of the low range. Yeah. So they've, they've copied Jeep. So they've copied Jeep on that one. Bad idea. Um, so in my opinion. A mechanical limited slip center differential, I believe, is standard. And an available rear electronic limited slip differential is optional. Um, it's not a Can you imagine like being, being the, like the guy who manages the factory and you have to... It's the like, same, then. It you, never you changes. Have to, you have to keep all these different... Four wheel drive or all wheel drive systems. There's three systems. No, plus, plus the lockers and you know, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of like, just a lot there. It's track one. And, and, and I say that because most people don't give a rats, you know what I mean? Well, I mean, all they care about is I want to, most people, okay, first of all, most people will not take this off road. Right, so then, then just so, they, so they don't care about all that, all that quadrant stuff, right? What they care about is, hey, if I'm driving on a snowy road or going to my snowy cabin, will it get me stuck or unstuck? And as long as this is all-wheel drive, that's what they care about. What? And, and if you're in that boat, just get one that's got all-wheel drive. So the rest of this to me, I'm sorry, but I think the rest of this to me is just for dealers to add options to make more money uh, selling these things to, you know, people who don't really care about what, what the underlying wheel management system is. As an off-roader, as I know you are, I am an off-roader. You but should this, be interested but, in it because this it's is very a, important. This is not a look. We, we've had a lot of expensive vehicles, and we've and, and in this class, right? So we, we, we've taken Yukons and Tahoes and suburban off-road, right? And for the most part, we don't ever take them into anything more challenging than maybe a rutted dirt road. And that's because most people, you know, we use them the way you guys use them, right? And most people will not take this into Moab. Why would you? Well, because. Unlike this vehicle, you, those, is this going to be an Overlander? Is that what you're saying? No, the, these are actually Jeeps. So hear me out. So let's talk about the air suspension. I've right. got all the stats here. Normal ride height, eight inches, which is pretty good. Yeah. Um, off road two, you have two different off road heights. You can get uh, up to ten inches of ground clearance, which is pretty damn good for the segment. That's I, a I, lot of ground clearance. I think maybe they uh, like watermarked. Um, or at least did a spreadsheet with what Range Rover is doing, because we're getting into Range Rover numbers here, right? Sure. And so they wanted to be competitive. Yeah, and then you keep in mind how much water do you think it can afford? 
Uh, thirty inches. That's a lot. Three inches. Thirty. Three no, it's it. No, it's it's not a camel. No, it. it, it, it can <laughs> Why can camels afford a lot? No, it can afford. They hold a lot of water, but can they afford two them? feet of water? Twenty-four inches. So I was off by six. Big deal. Uh, yeah, but the, that's a ridiculous number for a hundred thousand dollar SUV. The Defender will do it. The Defender won't do it. It'll be broken. I'd like to try to take it, that no, in two feet of water. It'll do. It won't do it officially. It's, it's it'll short itself out, height. and then you have to tow it and out of the puddle. Off-road height, it'll do, I think, 30. Yeah, uh -huh. And it's extra water fording height. So 24 inches, that's a lot of water for this class. Yeah, like, who's going to be fording 20? It doesn't matter. It's cool that it can do it. A full-size Range Rover never moves You know what people care about, Tommy? Approach, how departure, much it, and how much, this is, none, So the approach matters. angle is 25 degrees. No, the, none of this matters. What What about the departure angle? 24 degrees. Hey, look, if you look, if you want to take a luxurious vehicle off-road, get yourself a Grand Cherokee, which is what people will do, not a Wagoneer. What they will do with it, though, and this is impressive, is they will tow with it, and it does tow when configured right, right, 10,000 pounds, which is a big number. Yes, a lot, and I have the payload numbers. I mean, the TRX will tow 8,100 pounds, which has a Hemi Hellcat that puts out 702 horsepower. This bad boy will do 10,000. What's the payload number? Up to 10,000, yeah. So the curb weight on the most uh, weighty one is 6,420 pounds. Yes. So it is heavy. Tax credit. Um, <laughs> GVW, yeah, they're all over 6,000 pounds. So yeah. yeah, it would apply for the uh, the the Hummer Hummer tax credit there. Yeah. Um, so payload up to one thousand five hundred and eighty. Yeah. Sixteen hundred. That's pretty good. You, you know what's cra and people are calling me a Defender fanboy, but I, I know. I, stop the Defend talking the about Defender the Defender. Does, does like nineteen hundred, which is crazy. No, to me. it won't do nineteen hundred because you put nineteen hundred pounds in it. The air suspension will go, Pfft, and then you have no, to get wait, it to, it'll, to it'll, the shop. Officially, it'll, now this is your. Conjecture, but officially it'll do that or oh. 1800 or something. Anyway, anyway, I, I, it is impressive that it does tow um, that much uh, because you could tow basically. Oh gosh, you're you're talking about like a big horse trailer easily, right? Right. Uh, you know, probably a three horse three horse trailer with living quarters, maybe a bumper tow. If if those are bumper tow, I, I don't know how much the the, the, I don't the know how much big horse trailer. Jim way. Morrison, if you're listening, uh, you'd know that you tow horses. Uh, at that point, you might have to go with like a. Uh, you know, a truck, uh, but uh, it will also tow a big ass boat. Yep. A big ass toy hauler. Yep. With a bunch of like cool toys, so you could do a lot. It'll just tow a lot. I mean, it really will. It, it, it's basically pickup truck full size towing numbers, and maybe that's because it's built on the same chassis, like you said, or in the same plant. <laughs> yeah, made the same plant. The Ram will tow more. I mean, eventually it'll tow. It's, if configured right, the Ram will tow up to probably what thirteen thousand. So unlike your Defender, though, this has a much more usable. Our Defender. Unlike your, your your baby there, this has a much more usable third row. Yeah, 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 for sure. So the, the Defender the, the, has got a pretty pretty tiny third yeah. row. This this actually has captain's chairs in the second row, which are very luxurious. I don't know if they're standard or if they're optional, but yeah, know, the I ones don't. we had were, were captain's chairs. And then there is a very luxurious third row with its own cup holder, its own USB ports. Actually, it's USC probably. Uh, and then there is actually a good amount of space behind that third row, even when you don't fold it down. It's not as, it's not as big it's, as like a suburban. Yeah, the new suburban is just you, you could put a small Civic in there. Yeah, I mean it's not like a Yukon XL back there, but it's it is pretty good. Uh, I, I will absolutely give you that. And um, so, once again, you're going to make fun of me, but comparing the back seat of the. Grand Wagoneer to the standard Wagoneer. The Grand Wagoneer we were in had dual screens in the back of the seats. And then there's another screen for your HVAC in the middle. Yeah, there's a big 10.25 inch screen, um, kind of like you'd find on like an S-Class Mercedes in the middle that controls all the settings. Whereas on the standard Wagoneer, the climate was just this little baby screen um, on the back of the center console. So that was a lot nicer too. And the Grand Wagoneer had the big center um, like armrest, right? The fancy armrest with the big cubby and and the, the dual cup holder. So that was a little bit nicer as well. And then the Grand Wagoneer, we should talk about the engine because it's a big, it's the same engine that we had in the Durango SRT. It's a big engine, big old Hemi V8, not uh, mild hybrid. So there's no like, you know, nod to, we're trying to, you know, make this more fuel efficient. It's just super powerful. I want to say what, 471 horsepower, if I remember right? Yeah, I got to find the exact number. Yeah. Um, so the five, uh, here we go. Yeah. I just saw it. That's um, a lot of power. So the 5.7 liter in Hemi, the standard yep. Wagoneer features an 850 watt electric cooling fan and it's got the e-torque system. It's got a 321 axle ratio um, and the e-torque assist. And that total output is 
392 horsepower and 404 pound-feet of torque for right. the, the, the small V8. Yep, and how about the big V8? Uh, so the big V8 loses the mild hybrid thing, yep. and that just is like a Challenger engine. Uh, 471 horsepower, 455 pound-feet of torque. I'm not really sure, to be honest, Dad, if it's the transmission out of a Ram 2500 or if it's the tuning out of like the Durango SRT because those are two different 6.4s but I have a feeling it's probably the SRT version because of the high horsepower numbers. Um, it also has fuel economy with uh, fuel saver technology cylinder deactivation. Do we know the fuel economy? No, I don't think we they don't announced know. it. Although yeah. we do know the 0 to 60, the, the 6.4 is supposed to do it in six seconds. Wow, with a with a 392 axle ratio, allowing customers to optimize fuel economy and vehicle capability. There's not going to be much optimization of now, fuel now economy. Now, if you want the quicker one, get the Durango at this point, because that does it under five seconds. I want to say 4.6 with the same power plant. Plus, it's probably tuned much differently. So, at least exhaust is tuned differently. This one's very quiet and very understated. Uh, the SRT Durango, not the Hellcat. The SRT is loud and proud and basically a uh, uh, muscle car. Uh, that's disguised as a seven-seater, a seven-person, three-row family hauler. So, do you think that the um, um, Grand Wagoneer and Wagoneer is going to have a Hellcat version? No. You don't think so? No. What about an SRT version? I don't think so. Why not? Because it's already so expensive. You, you know, it goes from what eighty-six to like one oh something. One oh three. One oh three. Yeah, I just don't see. Having said that, you know, the Hummer EV is going to be one twelve, so maybe there is room. Uh, I don't know, dude. Uh, it just doesn't feel like an SR. Well, first of all, there's a couple of things. I don't think that there are going to be any more Hellcats out there, mm. period, right? I think with uh, Stellantis taking over, um, we're going to see uh, probably the trend going the other way, unfortunately. I think we're living at the high watermark of uh, high output, um, normally, con you know, high output supercharged. V8s. Uh, I, I got a feeling it's going to be all electric in the near future. Yeah, I think you're right. No, I, I don't think we're going to see a Hellcat version. Plus, they already have like the um, the Trackhawk, right? Which pretty much satisfies the the need for the and, folks that want to go fast with their for, family. For, you know, sometimes I don't get this, Tommy, but it's like all maybe, maybe we don't, just don't do enough product research uh, or future forecasting. But like every so often, like an, a segment explodes, right? So. For the last 10 years, the crossover segment has exploded, right? We're moving away from sedans into crossovers. And now this big, bold American SUV segment has just exploded. Yeah, I agree. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not just the traditional companies. Let's face it, Rivian is also making a competitor to this. E e e well, Basically. yeah, I mean, sort yeah. of. Yeah. I don't know how big that's going to be. Yeah, it's probably yeah. not going to be as big as a Wagoneer, but they are making a big American SUV that's all electric, right? Right, yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's going to be the next thing that Tesla announces after the Cybertruck. What, like a Model Z or something? I don't know what... Like it, a really it, big I don't know, Model sexy X. cars, whatever, whatever fits into that. Is it also going to have doors that don't work in the garage? <laughs> right, because, because the, the Model X, even though it is a seven row, is, is getting old and long in the tooth. Uh, so, yeah, that's true. Um, so, what are your overall impressions on the Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer? I like them. I like them a lot. I think uh, uh, you know they did um, what they needed to do. I would have liked to see probably more electrification. Uh, you know, the E-Torque is a mild hybrid, and it sort of kind of works. We had it in our Ram 1500, uh, and you know, basically, it allowed you to do stop-start technology. I would have liked to see you know them take it a little bit farther. I think beyond what they did. Uh, but uh, that's not uh, saying that uh, it's not a good vehicle. I mean, it's very luxurious. Uh, the interior, I think, is certainly, if not best in class, one of the best in class. Uh, uh, the styling is, is, it's not way out there. It's a little conservative in my mind. Okay. Right? Uh, and I love the fact that they're kind of redefining American luxury for the longest time, especially Cadillac, I think, has been trying to redefine German luxury as an American car maker, and that's not going to work. Right? We have dead straight roads uh, with much lower populations, especially out here in the West. Uh, and so, you know, the things that we need are very different from the things that the Germans need. We, we can't go, you know, unlimited speeds on our highways, uh, you know, but we can go very, very long distances without a gas station. So we need a lot of cup holders. We need a lot of room for, uh, you know, doing things that you probably at least initially the Germans thought were crazy, like having, you know, dinner in the car right. or sleeping in the car yep. or, you know, having the whole family in the car for, for days or weeks on end. 
So I'm a little bit, con I think it's a great vehicle. I'm, I'm really excited to drive it and to even put it in the dirt because we're crazy and, you know, see if it's a real Jeep and, you know, explore its comfort capabilities and stuff. I'm a little bit concerned about the marketing end of it um, because I published, uh, and it was an interesting kind of phenomenon, I published the two vehicles on our, our little TikTok channel, right? And we've been getting a lot of feedback from people that aren't like the typical listeners of the show. I mean, these are just non-car people, folks that happen well, to be Millennials, 20-year-olds, your yeah, age. Yeah, people that, but, but specifically people that don't really know about cars. Like they see a Range Rover, they think that's cool. They see a Tesla, they think that's cool. And there seems to be a lot of confusion between the difference of a Wagoneer and a Grand Wagoneer. There's a lot of confusion in this podcast between the difference. I, and it's not <laughs> us. I think it's, I think it's, you know, they're... They're trying to split hairs. You know, I would have probably just gone with, uh, you know, it, 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 if you're going to do it, maybe what they should have done or could have done is they could have made the Wagoneer a Dodge and the Grand Wagoneer a Jeep or vice versa. You, you see what I'm saying? Basically gone the route that Ford does with uh, Ford versus Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln or Chevy does or GM does with Chevy and GMC and, of course, Cadillac. Well, so the other thing, too, is... On the inside, they're very, they're very pretty different, right? Um, but on the outside, they look almost identical uh, between the Wagoneer and the Grand well, Wagoneer. The, I mean, the Wagoneer has a huge Wagoneer on the hood, and the Grand Wagoneer is a huge Grand Wagoneer. I don't think so. No, it's to say Wagoneer too. Yeah, so so the Wagoneer has Wagoneer written on the hood. The Grand Wagoneer has Wagoneer written on the grill. Okay. Um, so and does, does does the Grand Wagoneer have that uh, fascia that's a little bit kind of? Forward facing, so it's more you know sloped back, so it's kind of like that. Um, I'm looking at the two different, yeah. like it's got a slightly different grill. Yeah, the the lower front end treatments. My my point where I was going with this though is yeah. a Tahoe, right? Yeah, looks entirely different than an Escalade. Yeah, and that's taken years and decades to do. Yeah, I mean for a while there they looked the same, right? Yeah. Like they were very similar, and the Yukon was the same thing too. But nowadays, a sh like it's very clear that you bought the Yukon and you didn't buy the Escalade. Uh, it's not going to be as clear with the Wagoneer, the Grand Wagoneer, and that's going to be compounded by the fact that you buy them at the same dealership. And I think the other uphill battle they're fighting against is there's still a lot of brand snobbery, especially when you're paying ninety or hundred thousand dollars. And I think there's going to be some people that want to have the Mercedes experience rather than having the experience as the same person who's buying a Renegade. You know what I'm saying? I, I think if you're buying yeah, this I mean, really I mean, premium... Yeah, I mean, Hyundai and Genesis ran into that problem, right? Yeah, they, they, were, they were like Genesis. They were, they were trying to sell thing. a Genesis, which was like a Lexus competitor, out of the same dealership where like, you would go and get your Elantra serviced, right? Yes. So like, you'd be sitting there on plastic chairs reading like you know, dog-eared magazines with like a stale cup of... <laughs> <laughs> a of, cone of water. <laughs> of, of decaf coffee, whereas you go to a Lexus dealership and it's a spa, really. I mean, it yeah. is. They've got a spa, basically, or a golf golf driving range or, or, or you know, a computer lab. And um, I'm not saying that a Jeep dealer has a stale cone of water, but it's, it isn't quite the same experience as going to, like, a Lexus dealer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I agree. I think that's why uh, I think it's confusing. And then you've got the, the, the thing you were pointing out earlier where you say, hey, look, here, here's my new $90,000 CV. And they're like, oh, what is it? Oh, it's a Jeep. And you're like, you spent $90,000 on a Jeep? And you have to be, well, it's a Wagoneer. You know, it's got 6.4 liter Hemi and it's got premium wood on the inside and a cooler. And you kind of have to explain that. And it's not important to like someone like me who understands and appreciates cars, but if you're really into the brand, it might be hard to get someone into this over like a Range Rover. But I have a feeling. You have a feeling that they're going to, what, stick a uh, uh, veneer of fake wood on the Grand to Wagon here to differentiate it? Do you remember what happened to the Hummer H2? Uh, yes. Do you remember like the community that picked them up? Yes. I mean, it was like a lot of folks in Beverly Hills. Yes. Um, it was a lot of like the, the 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 music community. A lot of folks in the music community bought those, and that really, I think, drove a lot of sales. I think this is really going to resonate with a lot of those same folks because it's just so bold and big and in your face. I mean, it's like the anti-Tesla in so many ways. You know, I mean, it's it's like screw you. Here's 6.4 liters and wood on the dashboard. Uh, and I think that's going to appeal to a lot of folks who are uh, in the music community or in the movie community who are celebrities. Well, there you have it, guys. Uh, you've uh, thankfully spent another 45 minutes with us going over and deep diving into the Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer. I hope that we have left you as confused as we are. No, I'm just kidding. I hope we haven't left you as confused as we are. Uh, and uh, I like the vehicle. I think it's going to be successful. Uh, you know, it seems like the right vehicle at the right time. Uh, of course, there's that bad 
journalistic clash cliche, time will tell. Right. Right. So time will tell. Uh, but, uh, you know, thank you, Jeep, for giving us early access. And thank you guys for uh, letting us uh, spend 45 minutes with you. Yeah, we appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Ciao.